Thank you. So uh, this is um, a, a bit of an excursion for me. So I am primarily a numerical analyst by training, uh, which mostly means that I take anything that I can and turn it into either a linear system or an eigenvalue problem. Um, a surprising number of things can be dealt with that way. And this is one instance of that general uh, principle. So the, uh, the work that I'm going to describe is joint work with uh, one student who you will not see, Colin Ponce, who's now at Lawrence Livermore. He's on the left. Uh, the grinning guy on the right is Eric Lee. He's working with me right now. Uh, he's back in the back. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about the stuff that he's working on, and you can bother him during the poster session or breaks if you're interested in that stuff. And this is supported not just by uh, NSF, but also by ARPA-E, which is uh, like DARPA for DOE and is worth knowing about if you're interested in this space. Um, so the, um, the electrical power grid, one of the things that's um, worth keeping in the back of your head when we talk about power systems is that uh, effectively big chunks of the US are tied together synchronously so that when we talk about the Eastern interconnect or the Western interconnect, you're talking about generators that are all moving together, that are all tied together. If one goes down, it affects the other. So these are the, some of the biggest machines in the world, right? One of the things that this means is that we care a lot, not about just the efficiency of dispatching and unit commitment problems, but as we get more and more renewable integration and uh, more and more uh, variability in loads, there's additional security considerations as well. So we're concerned about what happens if something trips um, and that causes us to be in a situation where, for example, if something else trips, uh, we're going to see a blackout right, or, or some other type of fault. So we would really like to know as quickly as possible when certain events occur in the power system, like a generator tripping or a line going out. And I'd like to be able to identify that faster than the traditional systems can do so. So there's really two sensor systems that are available for looking at the state of the power uh, grid right now. The traditional one, which has been around for a long, long time, is uh, the SCADA system. So this is something that reports on power flow. It also reports on digital status measurements, so uh, whether lines are tripped or not, for example. Um, you get feeding readbacks or reading uh, every two or 10 seconds, so not super frequently. Um, and what we really get out of this is usually power flows. What we're interested in is voltage and current phasers. Um, and in order to go from one to the other, you have to do a power flow computation of the type that Ray was just talking about with map power. So it's a nonlinear equation solving problem. The good thing about this is that you get more or less complete observability of the transmission grid, ideally with a little bit of redundancy. There's a more recent set of measurements that we have available as well, uh, the synchrophaser system or phaser measurement units. Um, these were first commercially developed, I guess the first one was in 1992, so uh, I keep talking about this as a new technology when I give talks. It's really not, it's almost a quarter century old, but it's really only been in mainstream play for the past eight years or so. Uh, so in 2008, as part of the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, Congress gave the uh, system operators some money to um, deploy PMUs, and they have done so. Um, and now one of the things that uh, is sort of an interesting political problem is everybody was paid to deploy the PMUs. They weren't deploy, paid to do anything with them. So uh, New York ISO, for example, has a number of PMUs, which I've learned in the not too distant past, are completely uncalibrated and unmaintained, and they don't really believe any of the readings out of them. Um, and so they're reluctant to give us data about it for that reason, because they don't believe it. But if it's giving good data, you get GPS synchronized measurements. So they're very tightly synchronized. You know exactly when you're getting the measurements from. 10 to 30 reports per second, so much higher data rates than you get from the SCADA system. And you get a direct measurement of the phasers for voltage and currents on the lines. Um, and which is the thing that you want. So you directly measure the things that you want. The problem is that you don't have complete observability of the power network in most cases. So the SCADA information is more complete, uh, but less frequent. 
So can we combine these two sensing modalities in order to get the speed advantages that you have from the synchrophasers and sort of the complete observability advantages that you have from the SCADA data systems? And the answer, of course, is yes, or I wouldn't be ask, asking the question. So the way that we get the best of both worlds is we combine these model-driven state estimates with the PMU observations. And our goal is to try and say, most of the time we're operating close to a steady state. And what we're going to see in the PMU data that we really care about a lot is certain system events, things like a generator tripping or a line tripping that you might not get information about for a few seconds, but might become really critical for operating the power grid safely. And so the idea is, conceptually, we're going to match changes in what we see uh, in the power system state from the PMU to model predictions for what ought to happen under certain contingencies. So we say if the if some line tripped, we would expect the power uh, phasers to shift or the voltage phasers to shift by such and such an amount. Let's compare contingency by contingency. Now there's one little problem with this, which is that there's a lot of possible things that can happen. So in one of our tests we had about, we were looking at the Polish power network. We were looking at every possible line trip that could happen and a variety of substation reconfigurations. So you've got about 7,000 uh, possible contingencies to analyze. Uh, you do have to analyze it moment by moment because the shift in the uh, power state is going to depend on what the current power state is and that changes over time. And so we can't just do the obvious thing and run a simulation for every possible contingencies and check one by one. That ends up being too slow. So how can we do this fast? This is really the novelty of this particular method. And the answer is we do it with two things. One is we linearize, right? So I said I change everything that I can into a linear algebra problem. This is no exception. The second thing is that I don't bother for the most part to actually compute what's going to happen under each possible contingency. Instead, I say, what's a space of plausible signal changes that you might see under each possible contingency, and how close are we to that space? And only in cases where you're close to that space, where it's, where it's even plausible that this is a contingency that might have happened, do I do the slightly more expensive computation. This allows me to go from checking 7,000 uh, possible contingencies explicitly, so something that's moderately expensive, to computing five or 10 in most cases. Um, so the, the picture here is that we're going to compute this subspace. How exactly we do that doesn't matter a great deal. The thing that's relevant is that we can do it with a reduced model, which is much, much smaller than our model of the actual power system. And that we're going to say we know that this reduced space contains our predictions of what ought to happen and the distance to the subspace gives you a lower bound on the mismatch that you would predict from your model. You're going to sort things by uh, an ascending order by that lower bound, and now you're going to do the expensive computation until the curves cross each other, at which point you're done and you've got the closest contingency that you, uh, to the data that you've got. So this is one of several ongoing related efforts, um, and since I know I'm about out of time, uh, let me tell you there's other things that you should come and talk to me about during the breaks if you're interested. Uh, this is not the end of the road for this particular effort. So the work that I just described uh, is looking at behavior of steady states. In fact, there's oscillations in the power network uh, at any given time, both those that are caused by system events, so ring down oscillations, and there's also ambient oscillations. One of the things that we're looking at right now, and Eric is involved in this, and also an undergrad, Nate Rogulski, um, as we're trying to see, can we improve the uh, accuracy of the flyer method for identifying uh, topology changes and contingencies by looking at this frequency information as well. Um, there's some stuff with uh, planning and the distribution system, which is closer to what Warren was talking about this morning, um, which is in collaboration with a bunch of folks at several different universities, a couple of the national labs, and Eaton Electric is, uh, is running that effort. Um, and there's also some stuff that I encourage you to look at with uh, um, Edward, who's in the audience somewhere. He has a poster out, uh, outside as well. That's the substrate for many of these computations, which is a cloud-based platform for conveying the PMU information to where you're going to do the computations. And it's got replication for reliability and performance. And I encourage you to talk to Edward about that. With that, I'll finish up.